and fathers, brothers and sisters, and those that are joining us from every other platform to be part of this Sunday. It is a special Sunday. It is Education Sunday in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. It is a joy to gather with you as we reflect on the subject of education in all its, in, in all its frameworks and in all its expressions. And as a church, we also take this moment to come together and think and reflect on it. Welcome to this time of worship. It is good to be in the presence of God with you. A special welcome to those that are visiting us and those that are guests to this service, particularly our speakers for today. Welcome to our time of worship. As usual, we begin this time of worship by lighting the candle of hope, peace, and justice. And so we invite one of our young people to light the candle for us. Let us bow our heads and pray. On this Education Sunday, we light this candle to remind ourselves that our God is the source of all life, the fountain of all knowledge, and the giver of all wisdom. Eternal light, lead us from the shadows of ignorance into your marvelous light. May the education of every child be life-saving, hope-sustaining, and a solid foundation for building, a, for building sustainable communities. worship. Gracious and eternal God, you led us to curiosity about creation, ourselves, and all things unknown. Let us never lose our sense of wonder. God of Abraham and Sarah, you lead us to new understandings when we least expect them. God of the prophets, you call us to speak truth with love to a reluctant world. Ruler, you love us though we shrink from the challenge 
of discipleship. To every believer, the promise of God, the valleys of England, who truly believes that moment from Jesus, the pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. you may be seated as we gather our hearts and minds before God in prayer. Come, let us pray. God of holy wisdom, who caused all holy scripture to be written for our learning, we gather this morning yearning for wisdom to call us out of the darkness into the light of your world. We thank you that out of love, you challenge each and every one of us to spend our lives learning and discovering new things. Forgive us that often we trust more in our own cleverness than in your wisdom. 
We ask that you give us anew the strength to answer your call to wholeness. That we may truly give witness to your transforming love in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. as we prepare to receive the word of God and read to us by two of our young people, Unati Ngube and Mandombi Moyo. Today's first reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, and it reads, 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him, were, above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this, is, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. We receive the second lesson. I greet you all in the wonderful name of the Lord again. Amen. Um, our second reading is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> one day, as Jesus was... St one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesir, the people were crowding round him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets from a catch, for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up, the shore, up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, 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 oh,
Let us share the peace with those nearest to us in a COVID responsible manner. Superintendent Reverend Tsinga, Reverend Vilakati, all protocol observed, I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Our notices are as follows. We are saddened to announce the passing of Ndomzi Tiki from cell group 14 who will be buried in the Eastern Cape. Details of the prayer services and funeral will be advised shortly during the week. May I then ask that Reverend Vilakati lead us in a prayer. Also, please keep this family and other bereavement families in your thoughts and prayers. You are the giver and the receiver of it all. We thank you for the moments that we can celebrate that we've shared with our loved ones. And we mourn at the time when they have to depart into those hands that hold the universe together. And so we pray, O oh God, that may your comfort be known by the Mthigi family. We think of those that continue to grieve even beyond just that family. And ask for your comfort and your care and your compassion to be known by them. 
lead her into the time and place where there is no more mourning, no pain, but one equal love of presence into the time and place where you, O oh God, will wipe every tear from every eye, into the time and place when there are no more sunshine or night, but an eternity with glory forever and evermore. Amen. The Bethesda community continues to pray and support one another during the challenges and difficult times. We are praying especially for those who are sick at home or in hospital from contracting COVID-19 and for those families who have lost their loved ones because of the pandemic. Bethesda Methodist Mission encourages all members and friends to vaccinate as vaccination is our best defense against severe illness, protects our families and fellow con uh, congregants and community. There will be a finance meeting on the 8th of February at 6 o'clock via Zoom. Also, there is a steward meeting on the 16th of February at 6 o'clock via Zoom. Confirmation class and parents' meeting starts the Friday, the 18th of February at 6 at the GMM house. There will be a baptismal service, uh, Sunday service will be held on the 20th of February at 9 o'clock here at church. The service will also be live on Facebook and YouTube channels. The classes of baptismal starts on the 12th of February from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock at the GMM house, 42 St. John's, uh, the following house. All those who would like to baptize their children must attend the classes and also forward their contact details, e.g. name, cell number, email address to the church office, the, way, the one below that is stated on the screen. Today we do celebrate um, our educational Sunday. Let's get you into a genius mood. Study Jam 2022. Um, it's there. I can't see. I left my spectacles at the back. So all the details are, are there on the display. Uh, may I ask that those who are visiting for the first time at Bethesda, uh, can we please see you? Then we do our norm and do welcome you. If it's the first time coming to Bethesda, please stand and the choir will lead us in a nice song to welcome you at Bethesda. Thank you very much. You're welcome at Bethesda. If you do want to join, please see one of our stewards. Uh, we are friendly, welcoming, and very friendly. You can see us. Yes. So if you'd like to join Bethesda, you can see any of the stewards. Please can the stewards quickly stand so that you can see them. They are there. Stewards, you can, after church, meet with the stewards. Um, they will journey with you. If, if you want to join organizations, a cell group, they will lead you into that. Welcome to Bethesda. Very friendly church, smiling ever. <laughs> Any birthday celebrations from this week? May you please stand so we can celebrate with you your birthdays, milestones, anniversary, proposal, new job, new house. Yes, Mama? Birthday.
Thank you. Any anniversary, any celebrations, proposal, new job, relocating, let us celebrate with you. Thank you very much, Reverend Vilagati. Back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Greetings to Fundiso Vilakati. Greetings to our guests and our speakers for this morning. Uh, to our leadership of our church extensively, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and our virtual community. I greet you this morning in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Mine is just to introduce the day, or more of the day, and we move along to the next phase of our service. Now, normally around this time of the year, I mean, a number of people had already started uh, their classes. Academic year has started for many. You would have picked up in the previous weeks when we celebrated with the matriculants and then we acknowledged and prayed for our students as the year was starting, that that time has come. But the Methodist Church of Southern Africa as a whole normally takes the first Sunday into the month of February every year to commemorate education and to teach around education, to speak around education and its importance. This also um, being emphasized through educa I mean, education being made as one of our mission pillars in the church. So there is an emphasis to want to uh, not just stress on that on this one Sunday, but also through our programs, our activities in the church and things like that. Now we have, oh, we are at least a church that does some mission work around education, either through our bursary, a fund that we, 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 we do as one of the mission projects of the church and by assisting and coming alongside uh, with our young people uh, throughout the year to assist them in their academics uh, uh, as, as we move along. Now today is a special day because this is one day we want to have a special focus as you would have picked up on the notices or on the posters that were generated that we have a specific focus and a specific theme around our, our commemoration today. But before we get into that, uh, as I will hand over to the prof, I just wanna find out, is the Sunday school here? I see there's some here at the front. Is, if you are a Sunday scholar, please raise your hand. Wave your hand, let me see you. Wherever you are, wave your hand. Sunday school, wave your hand. Don't be shy, are you shy? Are you shy? 
Let me ask the Sunday school to stand and give us a song. Sunday schoolers, please stand. I'm asking for a nice warm song. The mothers and fathers are here. They're going to help us sing that song. Let's help them. Kanti kum nandi so ugu amano Jesu. Kanti kum nandi so ugu amana ye. Kanti kum nandi so ugu amano Jesu. Hallelujah, O Lord, Amen. Right, thank you, you may be seated. Now with me here, I have Ukungawo. Ukungawo, can you tell the church what grade you're doing at school? I'm doing grade six. Grade six, grade six, how old are you? I'm turning 12. You're turning 12, wow. All right, and what subjects do you do at grade six? I do African natural science. I do African natural science, PSW, creative arts, English, mathematics. And which one is your favorite? Maths. Maths? Uh oh. <laughs> so, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a soccer player. You want to be a soccer player? Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's hear, let's hear some more. Please tell us what grade you're doing at school. I'm doing grade six. Grade six? Yes. Same as Gungao. Yep. All right. And which school do you go to? I go to Sarathin Primary. All right. And um, what subjects do you do? Um, we've got PSW, NS Tech, English, Afrikaans, Maths creative arts, and a whole lot more. It's just I can't remember. A whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think that's a lot? Or you can cope? I think I can cope. You think you can cope? Is there any favorite in the subjects you do? Uh, I would say English. English. Yeah. You're good at English. Yeah. So what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a mechanical engineer. Oh, gosh. Can't even repeat that. <laughs> All right. And what do you think you're going to do to achieve that? Just work hard. Work hard. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> now I want to hear from the girls. Let me see. <laughs> you all scared. Let's see a girl. I've got a slab of chocolate waiting for you. Any girl that comes will receive a slab of chocolate. No one wants chocolate, right? No one wants goodies? Cool, come, 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 come. Let's clap for her as she comes up. Thank you. You tell us your name because you were being so brave today and confident. My name is Lilo Utando. Thank you, thank you. What grade are you doing at school? I'm in grade four. Grade four, which school? I am in Glen Hazel Primary. Wow, do you like the school? Yes. Do you have a favorite teacher at school? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and why? Because the teachers are rude to all of us. And why don't you have? You just don't. <laughs> How long have you been in that school? Um, I think half a month. You just got to the school. Yes. It's a new school for yes. you. Ah, now I understand. It's a new school. <laughs> Which which, which was your previous school? Um, it was in Pretoria, Rachel, Rachel de Pierre. Oh, and you had a favorite teacher there? Yes. Who was your favorite My teacher? My African's teacher. Your African's teacher? Yes. And why do you like your African's teacher? <laughs> because she was funny. She was funny. Yes. So what's your favorite subject now? 
Um, it's Africans. Africans. Yes. Wow. Wow. So I can take you with me when I go to other countries, right? I don't know. <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a fashion designer. A fashion designer. <laughs> Is there anything you're doing now just to make sure that you attain that goal? Um, no, I haven't started yet. You haven't started, but you're getting there. Yes. Thank you so much. Let's clap for you. I owe you a chocolate. Let's hear from our older folks. Um, Pindi, come, let's get you. Quick, 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 come. Pindi, I believe you're in tertiary. Please tell us where and what you're doing. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm in tertiary, I'm in CJC College in Langlach. All right, what do you do there? I'm doing office uh, administration. All right, and any aspirations for the future? I want to work and make money. You just want to have money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Finn. Thank you. <laughs> Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> Most of these introductions were just to give you an idea of the aspirations and the work that is happening within our very own community. We have children from all different grades, right up until tertiary. We do what we can to assist and to make sure that they do get to where they want to be in the future. Go Gwaksafani at that time when we just used to say, well, I'm, I'm going to school because my mother says I should go to school. You heard from their own mouths that they have dreams, they have hopes, they have likes, and they have dislikes as well. And ours is to come alongside with them to try and make sure that we become partners with them in trying to get them away. Tina Safunda, in a time when you were to school, I remember when I was going to tertiary, um, and, and, and my mother said to me, you will do this. No, 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 you're good in accounting, and that's where you're going. And I was like, no, but I don't want to do anything. I'm tired of counting. And I was like, mm -mm. you've achieved this and this and this, so this is what you'll do. And you do that because parents are parents. And only to find that along the way you think, actually, this is not it. You go again and start into another degree, and then you still think, ah, this is not it. Isn't that what's happening for some? Isn't that the experience for some people? And then your dreams are delayed. You would have been a doctor a long time ago, but you are still fiddling with teaching. And then you finished that, and then you went and did something else because you need to follow the line in the family, and, 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 and. Look where am I, Ngoku. <laughs> <laughs> Let me not waste more time. Let me give over to Prof, who will then introduce our speakers and our topic for this morning. Thank you so much. I'll probably be a bishop by now, Prof, if I just <laughs> don't <laughs> All right. Um, the manga cool from this. Um, so let me begin by inviting our panelists. They, they look like they're going to sit very far from you. But uh, let's call them up. Um, okay, let me do it myself. Can I don't finish? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Bianca, come join us. You, you've got the first choice of seat. <laughs> yeah? And then let's call Odwa. 
So, uh, Sis Odwa is our high school principal. We'll catch up from our conversation from last year with her and Bianca. And then, uh, Sis Nulit, or Okanyo Dogotes. And uh, let's be clear, it's not me a medical doctor. Yeah? Uh, it's a doctor of philosophy. Uh, how do we say? Exact more. <laughs> and then let me call up our other doctor, uh, Dr. Tandi Lewin, our special guest uh, this morning. Uh, Tandi is... Uh, Acting Deputy Director General for Universities in the National Department of Education. And uh, I'm sure most of us know that uh, Dr. Vokuza is a Senior Executive Director at UJ. Last year we had her boss here. Okay, quote-unquote boss here. Um, we had uh, Prof. Marwala here last year. And so we hope then to have a conversation this morning. I must apologize um, for... Uh, Siliki, Tlabane, remember him from last year? Uh, Chief Director in the Department of Basic Education. Unfortunately, uh, he can't make it. He sent me a message earlier this morning to say there was heavy flooding uh, in his home overnight and he s profusely apologizes for not being here. So, it's been a, a challenging 12 months. Just think about it. Last year when we were sitting, okay, we were not sitting here. We were in our homes and the panel was here, uh, beaming live to our homes um, on Facebook and on YouTube. And we were in the midst of the second wave some of us at the tail end of the second wave. And you will recall the extraordinary difficult period that we went through. We lost so many mothers, our mothers and fathers, and friends and colleagues. And then came the third wave as well with a bang in winter. And then came the fourth wave, but really it was the second and third wave that also had a significant impact on our school, college, and university system. We lost hundreds of teachers. We lost many academics. We lost vast numbers of friends and colleagues in the college, in the college and in the university sector. And then we had to push on again with online learning for most of last year, if not for all of last year. And so the question, I guess, that must arise is how is it that our institutions are still standing, quote unquote, standing? What's going on inside our institutions as we speak? And how are our institutions responding and providing the support that our students, our learners need at this time? And so it's been challenging. And yet, so many of us are still standing. And so we want to begin then the conversation this morning with that question. Twelve months on, are our institutions still standing? What is the condition of our institutions? And remember by institutions, we don't just refer to the buildings. We've seen many of our schools devastated by the storms and the floods. We also speak of the people, 
our school principals and their deputies and their HODs and the teachers. We speak of the learners. We speak of our parents, our school governing bodies. And the same in our college and university system. And so that's what I want to begin the conversation with. And I'm going to begin at the top and then at national system level and then work ourselves to individual institutions. Um, and so that's part one of the conversation. As I turn to Tandi, if you would want to perhaps reflect on this question, are our institutions still standing at system level? Um, and if so, why are they standing? And as they are standing, what are the key challenges and, or, or perhaps even what are the lessons that we've learned? And what remains to be done in the period ahead? So let, let's just clean this one. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I can be heard, yes. Thank you, Prof, and um, thank you for inviting me. And um, if I can give some insight into these questions. Um, most certainly, the system is still standing. So I, I work in the post-school education and training system. The department is responsible for the universities as well as for the public TVET colleges. Well, all of the TVET colleges, of course, and, and the private universities as well, private higher education institutions. Um, and also for the skills development system um, for adult education through the community education and training colleges. But I'll talk specifically about the universities. Um, it has been a tough two years. Um, it's been a tough two years for the institutions because of the move to more and more online learning. Um, and of course the difficulty that many students will have had in accessing um, the kinds of technology that they needed. Although. If you look at some of the data, we've actually done really quite well. If you look at the majority of students have been able to access the, the technology that they needed through um, machines, uh, electronic devices. Um, the difficulty is, is often on the data side, but um, government was able to negotiate uh, special rates for students, for universities. Uh, it was tough for the academic staff because they had to learn new skills quite quickly. Um, and diff universities were at different levels of being able to adapt to more online methodologies. But the system has shifted quite significantly in a way that's going to change the way things are, are going to work going forward. So definitely there's going to be more use of technology to support learning and teaching. Although we are hoping this year that in 2022 people will be able to go back to class, more contact teaching. Um, because of the restrictions coming down, because more and more people are vaccinated, um, there is a, a currently a discussion about, about vaccination in the higher education sector. There's some different views about it. Um, some of the universities have taken a very strong route to say we, we need our, you know, all our students and staff to be vaccinated. Some are taking a more cautious approach, but at the end of the day, um, all the way to, from the student leadership up, there's a great deal of support and, and currently it looks like about just well over 60% of students are vaccinated, which is a, is a very, very positive figure. Um, it's quite a lot better than it was towards the end of last year. Um, and most staff, I mean, in the system, probably well over 75% of staff. Um, and the university system, people have been very lucky that to have access to vaccinations. A number of our universities and colleges actually are vaccination sites in themselves. So it's been, it's been relatively easy for students in the system to be vaccinated, not necessarily everywhere else. Um, but the system is still standing, I guess, because the demand is incredibly high. We have a very high performing university system that in, 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 in the continent we perform very highly. It's a very small system. 26 public universities is, is by, by global standards, quite small. Um, it's quite a diverse system. We have some institutions that play in the international arena, arena. all of them have incredible areas of expertise. Um, and we are actually doing relatively well. If you look at all the metrics, uh, 
if you want to look at whether it's student throughput and the numbers of students that complete university, whether you want to look at the numbers of students who uh, are, are entering and the, and, and the, the profile of those students, um, if you want to look at um, the, the scope of areas of study, um, the growth in, in areas of demand that we need for society uh, and for the economy, um, we're doing pretty well in all of those metrics. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe just if I can uh, talk quickly about some of the main challenges. Our, our biggest challenge currently, you know, is, is, the, is how do we move, uh, you know, into a relative, hopefully a relatively normal academic year, um, you know, with COVID still with us, but, you know, with, with being cautious, but also, you know, allowing students to have a more normal experience um, in universities. Most of our students are in contact universities, but we do have about a third of the system is students who are in UNISA and who are studying via a distance mode. Um, so, and, and of course there's, there's a call for more and more use of online learning so that we can get more students in. One of the biggest challenges we have, and um, maybe this is what the other panelists will talk about, is more and more young people are qualifying for university education, which is an incredibly, uh, it's a good sign because it means our schooling system is performing much better. Uh, more and more young people are qualifying this year. I think the, the students who qualified to enter could, a bachelor's could, degree could is I about pause to... There, uh, just oh, on that point, no, on that point, um, we've seen lots of debates about the quality of our national senior certificate, about its value. <coughs> um, strong suggestions saying that um, if we compare with peer nations, our national senior certificate doesn't cut it. Um, strong arguments, um, not always founded on science, but strong arguments uh, suggesting that if our national, if our graduates from our schools go to Zimbabwe or to Tanzania, they won't do as well in university. Um, so, so big, big, big concerns, um, if not in the total public mind, in parts of the public mind, there seems to be concern. Is, is that concern valid? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think we should never forget that our education system was built off a base of very serious inequality. So the schooling system does retain the, the vestiges of that inequality, and so does the university system. However, if you look at all the metrics uh, that are measured, and South Africa does participate in the the international studies that, that do comparative work across, uh, across whether it's maths and science or whether it's uh, reading for learning and those kinds of things. And we are improving uh, in leaps and bounds in all of those areas. What, what we are still struggling with in the system is, in fact, aspects of this inequality. So that there are some schools that it could perform incredibly well. There are other schools that are improving. But on, on all the metrics, we are improving uh, in the basic education system. And you can see this in terms, of, you know, in terms of who gets access to higher education. And of course, that's a huge pressure for us as a country because we need to plan for that. Um, and, and we do not have the, the spaces in the university system that can absorb all the students who may, who may come in. But prof, in most countries in the world, the gap between uh, uh, schooling and university is, is, is not a simple matter. There's, it's, it's a big issue for us. It's, we call it the articulation gap, the gap between you know, what it, you know, achieving at school and what it means to achieve at, a, a, at the level of university. Um, and there's a huge amount of work going on both between, you know, in terms of curriculum development and, and teacher development, between the basic education department and the and the higher education system, which is where all our teachers, you know, graduate from. It's where our teachers are produced. So, so the issue is really, um, you know, how can we keep improving? How can we provide more space for students? How can we provide the kind of support that young people need when they enter college or university, both academic and other forms of support, financial support, which I won't go into now because I know it's a big issue, is one of the main areas of policy development and policy uh, discussion in our, in, in our whole education system at the moment, particularly given that the national 
fiscus is under very se severe constraint. We're not in a good position in either the economy or in the national but, uh, but treasury. Isn't, isn't that also an issue we, we should celebrate? The fact that, is it 360,000, 350,000? That families with income less than three, let me get it right, three, th less than 350,000 rands family income, that you, once you qualify for admission into a university, the state would ordinarily then provide for your fees, tuition, uh, accommodation, um, support for books, for uh, transport, and a few other subsidies that the state provides. Isn't that something we should celebrate, even as we are short? But the, the media says we are short by 10 billion this year. The fact is that almost half of the students in the public university system are funded by the state. Am I right? In fact, it's more. Um, mm -hmm. It's about 62% of undergraduate students that are supported through the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Um, and it's growing. I mean, it has grown. So that's over 600,000 students. It is. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and then, of course, in the TVET colleges, it's well over 90% of students. So, so it's, it's massive, it's massive because financial support is one of the biggest in a, a, a disenablers of access. So if you, if you can't fund university tuition fees and you can't fund the other things that you need to do well at university, it is one of the main factors um, that causes people to, to not be able to get through university or to not even be able to register in the first place. Um, so it's been a massive enabler, um, even, in, you know, even in the previous dispensation where students didn't receive this fully subsidized support, they received a, low, a combination of loan and bursary funding. And of course the threshold for family income was substantially lower. Um, even on, in those days, students did on average better than the average students in the system. So, so, so funding you know, to support students really is an enabler of success. Uh, and a very important one. And this is a massively important part of the funding that government does provide for Thank higher education. Yeah. Th thanks very much, Tandi. So, um, Nolita, doctor, um, where's that spray? Doctor, UJ is very popular. <coughs> uh, I see that UJ had something like 309,000 applications and fundis for 10,500 first year places. So uh, almost 30 applications on average for one place. Um, so what's going on there? It seems as if the institution is still standing. <laughs> Thank God for yeah. cool. the opportunity to come. If it were not for Professor Rensberg, perhaps I would still be attending virtually. <laughs> and, and so he forced me, and so he is in my uh, autobiography, <laughs> where he, after COVID, he forced me to come, and I'm happy that it happened. So as I walked in, I had goosebumps, because I knew that for the first time, I was going to join um, fellow parishioners and... I know who said where, and those are not here with us. Mm. And, and so I felt it, and I'm a bit emotional about being back at church, feeling um, lucky and blessed to have survived, but also very sad that as I sit here, I don't see Udadum uh, Tebu, I don't see Braaik, I don't see people who are not with us. And so thank you, God, for saving us thus far. Um, food is, um, and, and Prof, um, I, I wrote a lot of things and then I decided not to write, read any of that. <laughs> um, you see, we are still standing. Perhaps for the church, and because we are also parents, just a little bit of understanding of what goes on in the universities during COVID time. So COVID time came and everybody was shocked. It was unprecedented, no experience of how to handle it. And then it was locked down five, and then the, the world was muted, and then the universities were muted. And what we did, which 
uh, now uh, makes us to be proud was not to close down the residences. And, and therefore we didn't. Of course, students being given an opportunity to, to go home or to, to go anywhere, many of them left, but some remained. Um, and they started a whole um, interaction of poverty and affordability. It depended on whether you afforded or you did not afford. Um, and of course, I think for the sake of the parents who are here, uh, students who had left, because at one point we have 7,000 students on campus and then we have 27,000 students staying elsewhere. But then for those who stay in the, on campus, we got so many letters that came from them, some with photographs of GBV at home. And therefore, they wanted to come back to university. And while we had a policy that it was a one-way policy because of, we did not want you to go away and next week you decide to come back because we do not know if you come back, you were not going to be able to infect the others. So yes, you could, but it was very difficult to come back. And of course, many of these um, uh, uh, um, requests were made with all evidence that accompanied and that gave us a, 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 a clue of what is going on inside the homes. And that in the homes, there, is, there are homes that understand that students need support and all. Of course, there are homes that don't understand that. But there are also homes who do not have an infrastructure that allows a student to study. And of course, there are homes that are running their own businesses and therefore the student cannot study. And there are homes who will beat up their children as they did they would end up in hospital. So we decided that we are going to allow students but put them in a separate uh, a, a residence so that they are isolated and, 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 and tended to. What was the lesson there? The lesson that there are many of those, uh, I have no, uh, Tandi, the way I do not know how homes have become places of unsafety. And what has come to light is that us institutions of higher learning are more than just institutions of higher learning. We are places of safety and we are home. And that us, whether we are management or we are lecturers, we are acting in local parentis. And also that we are talking to children now who are articulating from high school to university. It is a whole different ball game to completely. Because they don't know it's a vast space, it's an independent world, you meet, you are exposed to people who are brighter and have all these things, and these issues affect students. And students react very differently to situations. As such, we have incidences and lots of depressed students. We have a lot of depressed students. We've got facilities that try to help the students to deal with their situation. Johannesburg, for example, is an inner city and the biggest in South Africa. And therefore, it is an attractive destination. And even though there are colleges that are there, students will still prefer to come to a university because it is an attractive destination. But dealing with it is different from wanting to go to it. Because when they get to it, then some of them get overwhelmed. They get overwhelmed. We have lots of depressed, we have lots of anxious uh, students, and some of them commit suicide. Others, they attempt to commit suicide. And I think, therefore, for me, a prof in my end, is that there has to be a dialogue. And I mean, the dialogue can be in subsets. We also need to speak with the homes of the children. And that when you give us a child, then we can't just take a child as a statistics. We can't just take a child as a number, with a student number. A child comes with his all and her all. And there lies the disjuncture between success and failure. Sometimes, even though there are suspicions of the quality of metric and all of that, the other part of what makes the situation worse is the inability of student to deal with the new world of the university. I regretted that the beginning of COVID forced children to go away 
because those 10,000 new students that we had, we've got 51,000 students, those 10,000 students that we had and had to leave in March, most of those had been waiting for the first year for more than five, three years, two years. And when they came, the university closed. Guess what? More than 30% never came back, and that's gone. And so maybe, and, but we are there, we are still standing. We had to deliver devices for students throughout South Africa. We had to deliver devices throughout. We had to give students data in order for them to connect. And remember, I come from Pedi, in Ushua. So Ekaya, there is no number. It's a village. So you can imagine if a courier, DHL, is going to go to Pedi and want to know Nolita Vogus. It takes three, three, three days to... But we had to do that up until every student had a device, up until every student had data. But of course, there were students where there were connectivity issues, and then we had to invite them back home. Students are indigent, the students that we, 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 we deal with. They don't have food. They don't have food. Your mom and dad can make that 350, but that's not all. They have to eat. And so there are these students who are born of parents who can afford to spend the last penny they have, send them to university. But when they are at university, they don't have any, any money to maintain their being at university, even if it's day students. And so we offer full, full food assistance program where students must come and eat, and then they can take food home. And this is a reality. And so we deal with all these things. It is COVID on the one hand. It is the, the world of independence. Because when you articulate from teacher to lecturer, it's not just in the concepts. It's the whole thing of articulating. A teacher is not the same as a lecturer. A lecturer is going to come with a laptop and say, you reference in this, and then you go to the library. You get to the library, you don't see any books. And yet you are supposed to research. And so these are big worlds for the students, and therefore orientation is important. Th thank, you. thank you very much, uh, uh, Nolita, for bringing home to us um, some, of those di some of those issues that we either take for granted or that we don't apply our minds to from the mental health of our students, and for that matter, the mental health of our academics. Um, uh, equally important. Um, the experience of our young people wanting to be on campuses of universities rather than at home um, for the reasons that you have mentioned. Um, Gender-based violence, femicide at home, I think we all saw a serious spike um, in that during, during COVID, um, beginning in 2020, uh, right through to where we find ourselves now. And it's an utter disgrace that young people feel safer away from home than at home. And so there are issues there for us to, to think about and reflect on um, that our homes often are not safe. In addition to that, as you've pointed out, many of our young people live with their parents in shacks. So how do you study at home? Um, many parents live in apartments here in Hillbrow or in similar setting. And then the mother works from home and the father works from home, if there is a father for that matter. Um, and there's no space to work at home. And so let's keep these in mind. And yet our institutions and our systems still progressed, even amidst this drama, even amidst this pain, even amidst this suffering. Um, and challenge that, that is being experienced. So let us turn to reflect on the last year from a school's perspective, and then I'm going to invite questions uh, and observations um, from um, us here who are gathered, if there are any questions or contributions, as well as from um, our brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who are on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, so, Bianca, how's it been? I mean, we spoke last year this time. Uh, how have things gone? Is there any um, 
Has there been any improvement for you? Um, is there, is, has there been, have, have you felt supported um, during this period? Uh, you're in grade 12 this year. Uh, how did grade 11 go? Um, it was a very challenging time. You know, when they say we have tried and we've tried and we've tried, we have really worked to get to the next grade. Um, it was a very tough time, mainly because throughout the year, obviously, we had to switch from rotational timetables, coming to school on certain days, seeing your teachers on certain days. And towards the end of the year, the department said we should write fully fleshed exams, meaning that we have to go back to school. There's certain things you haven't done throughout the year. There's certain topics that you haven't done. But it meant that you had to work extra hard. You had to work. You had to motivate yourself through that time. It was very challenging mainly because, number one, the school had to have made plans for us to come back on a daily basis. Imagine that short period of time. You are, you are learning, you're still adjusting, number one, as a human being to going back to normal school. And as much as that's what we wanted, but there's also effect of going back to normal school. And when we went back, it was very challenging because, number one, our infrastructure also was, it was, it was a, very, a very difficult thing to go through. Number two... Just tell it the way it is. There's it, nothing like a difficult state. It, 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 was, it was very tough, to be quite <laughs> honest. And, but, but we made it through. We made it through, to be quite honest. And it was, it was a very challenging situation mm -hmm. for all of us because you are transitioning, number one. That, oh, grade 11 tests were, were a lot. But now you are moving from tests that were set by the school to exams. And you can imagine from grade 10, since we've chosen our subject, you've never written a fully fleshed exam. So it was very challenging. It was, it was a very challenging situation. But, you know, teachers really tried. Teachers really tried. Um, and most of the work was done by us, as usual. So, yeah. <laughs> So, so as you as you um, you speak of challenges, but you also imply um, resilience. Um, so, so if you think back then over last year, what is the one thing that stands out in terms of the support that you have received or not received? Um, Who would you say number one? Who would I say number one? Mm, who mattered the most for you? I have to say myself. I don't want to lie. Okay. <laughs> I, I really have to say myself. Um, you know, it was so tough to, to just move, to keep moving every single day on a daily basis. Your teacher, one, thinks, ah, oh, life science is more important. Your other Afrikaans teacher thinks, ah, oh, my subject is more important. You are battling, you are gripping, you, you, you are, you know when you, you don't even have time to think, a second to spare. But it was within finding resilience in ourselves. I personally don't want to say I received support from any teachers. I, and as much as they've done their part as teachers, but... Uh, I, I didn't feel any support coming from them. <laughs> All right, so, so inner resilience, um, and, and it's self-evident that you're going to face many challenges in the years ahead, in the decades ahead. And I think for each one of us here today, as we reflect on our journey or journeys over the last two years, let us remember, let us remember how we got through. Because this will stand us in good stead, stead for the many battles that lie, and challenges that lie ahead. Right? 
um, is a Joel Austin who, who tells us uh, every now and then, um, for every setback, the comeback is waiting. Yeah? For every setback, the comeback is waiting. Yeah? And that is the message um, I think I'm hearing from you. Um, you have not spoken about your spiritual journey. You may want to reflect on that. Um, you know, sometimes you get to a position where you are in school and you see that your fellow peers are really struggling. And I think our schools have left out how important spirituality is. I think, you know, with our new system, you know, spirituality was never a thing that was set, like impressed or, or imposed upon us or taught that it is an important aspect of your life. Because I don't want to lie, only God. Only God, when you see how some people are really struggling, you see how their mental, you know, they, they're not in a position where they themselves, but you have to keep pushing. And so sometimes we'd find ourselves in positions where you are like, okay, today we have to pray. Today we have to pray and trust upon our Lord because you'd find that you are writing today and you're writing tomorrow or you're writing two subjects per day because of the pressure that the, well, the teachers had to get us out of school immediately so that other grades could progress with their exams, meaning that I had one week to write my exams and I had to write double session every single day. You go back, to, you go back home, you're studying for the next session. So that, that honestly meant that when we felt weak, we had to draw strength from somewhere. So, so you're not one of those who go to uh, exam, or the, just before the exam, you are not prepared, and then you pray. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but then sometimes it's just, it's just a mess. You are a mess. You are looking for something to... To, you know, to give you courage, something to give you motivation, something to keep you still. So, so do, you think, do you think that there's something that we can do better as a congregation, as a society to su provide support? Um, I think just emphasize how important it is that throughout everything, we involve God in every single thing that we do. I think sometimes within our educational school, we sometimes forget that outside of school, you have a home. Outside of school, you have support. Outside of, you know, certain things. And so I believe that it is so important that we still encourage spirituality in our schools. Yes, I was going to just uh, uh, pick up on that and say that one of the strengths of our society is lies in its multiplicity of organizations. I'm a daughter. Okay. And our mama provides, and of course our cell groups, the youth, Wesley Guild, um, our Sunday school setting, our youth groups provide space, our cell groups I've mentioned, right, provide spaces where we are able to what is the word I almost said? Be vulnerable. What, is the, what did you say? Be vulnerable. And if? Be vulnerable. <laughs> yes, I like that. Put your burden, right? Um, and receive support. And so I just want us to constantly be aware then, encourage us in our organizations, in this wonderful um, congregation to just create constantly the space for these conversations, um, these unburdening, these conversations that make us vulnerable. Because it is there where we are able to draw the courage, the strength, the support. It is there where that comeback is made possible. Yeah? So, um, Sis Odwa, you've heard uh, Bianca. Yeah? Ukalapa. Uh, 
They are complaining there. Uh, I'm, I'm just emphasizing the word complaining that uh, she didn't get support from teachers. Do you want to perhaps from your side um, also reflect on the last 12 months about your personal journey as a leader and your own journey um, um, as you um, provided leadership and stewardship for your teams and for, for the young people? Um, your reflections? I mean, you, one of the one of the big concerns that, have, that, that we have seen is that this rotational situation by way of example has seen us lose possibly half of the school year last year. Is that a fact or is it just musings of people? Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Amen. <laughs> Don't be shy of the microphone. Eh? I'm seated. Um, I, I thought this time we were going to use a, a podium. You know what? As, as teachers, we I can give you a podium. No, no, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Oh, okay. So, as, you know, as teachers, uh, when we're addressing uh, the audience, we prefer to, to stand up. Yes. And to us, it shows uh, respect. Uh, we <laughs> Don't be shy. And then we, we only sit down during accounting sessions, uh, whereby you have a district official coming to your school and you'll be with the HOTs and they were asking you the, about the performance of the school. Mm -hmm. So we only sit down then. But yeah, I'll, I'll try, Prof. I'll try. Um, uh, uh, prof, um, the COVID-19, it has hit the most vulnerable. Hardest. So is the education system is no exception. When COVID hits the globe, learner attendance has to change. We were given um, types of attendance that we, we can opt to. It can be traditional, it can be daily attendance. But for the daily attendance, it will depend to the capacity of the school. With the rotational, it was a very most difficult one because we never thought how to navigate around it. I said I always tell uh, my colleagues at work that um, teaching, it is a calling because we, we had to make ways. Example, uh, prof, um, whether we like it or not, the, the 4IR is here as long as we still have the COVID-19. With 4IR, this is how, the, with 4IR we're introduced to a remote learning and the and the, um, what you call this, uh, remedial programs. With e remote, uh, remote learning, it's whereby learners, you have to engage with learners using your, your smartphones, uh, the TVs, the radios, and et cetera. And Prof, we, we were also aware that uh, learners, they differ. There are learners, they come from the, the less privileged and of which they don't have a data. But as I'm sitting, my school, um, we opt to use uh, the WhatsApp because parents, they all buy the WhatsApp data. Any other data, it's so, it's so expensive. So as Dr. Linda next to me also mentioned that um, the learners and the students now, they rely more on their resources to continue with teaching and and learning. A remote learning is the, the two-way interaction between the teacher and the learner, and it can enabled by using the appropriate technology. Remote learning now, it is the way to go, Prof, especially when we go on rotational uh, classes. I would say to the primary school parents, they must allow their children to use those gadgets. Because for us to have the fruitful education, we can all, it can only take place by using those, those smartphones. But now, Prof, as we are sitting now, we received a circular that was re released on the 3rd of February that we are going back, uh, all public schools, they are going back to 100% attendance. 
and we, we are ready, I would say we are ready as the schools. All right, I was wondering if that is a notice for us. For this. Going. Um, so I'm going to come back to the panelists in a moment. I'm going to ask uh, a question. If there's one thing, at most two, that you want to see this year, given what, we have, what you have shared with us, if there's one breakthrough, uh, or at most two breakthroughs that you... And then secondly, I'm going to ask you about how you coped personally. I did ask Bianca. How did you cope personally? I'm going to come back to you with those two questions. But before that, Mufunis, is uh, anything from the... No questions from Facebook or YouTube. Can I therefore just check if there are any questions or comments that we have? Uh, yes, but one. Um, a microphone, come to the front. Come to the front because there's fa Facebook and YouTube. So you do need a microphone. Yeah. Uh, good uh, morning, program director and the panelists. My don't question, be shy. Yeah. Sure. My question is mainly focusing more on the Department of Education. We as parents, we aspire to have our kids well educated, so that tomorrow. They are capable of fending for themselves, being independent. But what we've picked up, a lot of youth, they are crying that, look at me, I'm educated, graduate, can't find a job. That's their language. It then therefore discourages, remember youth, they are the majority. It, it discourages others to follow similar lines because they use that is an example to say, look at him or look at her. She's got this paper. She's a graduate, but she's as good as us. She can't find a job. My question is, is there a relationship between the department in terms of their future strategic planning on courses? Do they ever sit down with business? To say business, what it is that you want. Because business plans. Business will tell you what they intend doing in 10 years time. Is the government also with them to say the direction now in terms of skills is going this way. It's no longer that way. So that you could also prepare your courses, your subjects, so that they fit in with that. And also, if you look, going back to our education legacy, only colored Indians, whites, were into technical schools. That is why you find very few blacks in the DIY space. We don't know. If, if my tap is running water, I don't even know where to go. I'm thinking of calling a plumber. Now, why are we also not focusing? Because currently, all our kids, they are more on the academic side, and not all of them are going to make it that side. And it depresses them if they can't go through there, because the other side, there's no emphasis laid on the other technical skills that you could become a welder and be the best welder. I grew up in Port Elizabeth. I know at some stage, in terms of artisanry, because it's mainly your motor car industry. I was shocked when, the, when it was said that, in fact, the country is short of artisans. The country short of artisans, what does that mean? It's because we were told for you to be educated, you go to have a PA, you go to have a BSc, you go to be a lawyer, and yet those other careers are quite good because people can fend for themselves. You're not depending on getting employed. You can employ people. That's the end of my question. So. Good, good, good one. Let's just check uh, over here. Do we have any questions, Mom? About Mom? Any observations? Don't be shy. I'm sure you've got a question. And you don't have to ask it in English, right? No? 
Yung Hindi shop up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, upstairs, any any questions or or comments from upstairs? Okay, we've got two more over here. You can come forward. Mocheti, did you have yours? Please come forward. But there's no one else. All right. Thank you, Chaperson. I think what, what, what Chipa has raised um, is similar to what I will be talking about. In fact, um, from, from listening from the speakers, one of the challenges that um, I think is facing our education system is the availability of resources. Um, the environment in, in which our students find themselves in are not appealing to the kind of the quality of education that we want. The infrastructure in the schools, um, the resources that are provided, um, they lack to match the skills that we want to produce. The second thing is the curriculum, as Chipa has, has indicated. We, 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 I would say um, during the apartheid, we are crying about what we call a Bantu education. But what have we done to change that system in order to adapt to the situation that we want to, 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 to create or the society that we want to create? It's a reality that um, um, for us is to look at whether one becomes a doctor, becomes a lawyer, because probably someone in the community is a doctor or is a lawyer or I see those kind of, of skills that are available uh, within, within the area where I live. But in terms of, um, okay, I would say back then, the, I, I don't know whether it's still happening now, the teachers would be able to spot a student at an early stage that this student, if he can be directed to this kind of a career, then she can, he or she can achieve this, this kind of qualification. But the, uh, what, what I'm seeing is a reality that we're producing uh, people who study management, and there's a lot of those people that study management. And, and how can you be a manager uh, not being, uh, having started? being a, 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 a clerk on the ground or being a messenger or being something that, that then will take you to understand what is it to be a manager. So the, the, there are those challenges that the, 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 what we produce is not able to be absorbed in the current form of our, of our employment, uh, what you call, um, as, uh, so, so, so important questions there about pathways from school and beyond. Big concerns raised that the schools, our school curriculum itself is limiting. Concerns that it doesn't offer us a route via a technical vocational stream by way of example. And of course, I've got my own regular question, which is, after I've been to high school, I finish my NSC, and then I go to a college because I don't make it to go to a university. The impression I get is I have to start again. I have to go back to standard 8 or grade 10 when I go to a TVET college in order now to start a new, to repeat standard 8, 9, 10, grade 10, 11, 12. Yeah? So big questions raised about the pathways 
and that those pathways are limited by the curriculum that we offer. And can I also throw in my little bugbear, um, as somebody was responsible as an official in the National Department of Education for the national curriculum in 94, 95, we put in math literacy so that everybody could have mathematics. That was the idea, right? But those who should do maths must do maths. The rest of us should do math lit. But of course what happens is that in schools serving the poor, right, rural and urban, you are told no math lit, math lit. And we know when, when you come to university, what can you do with math lit? We can do, you can do something, I know. As a former vice chancellor, I know you can do something, but you can't do engineering. You can't do medicine. You can't do natural sciences. Yeah? You might go to do humanities <laughs> and social sciences, which is very interesting. In any case, uh, those are some of the questions that obviously are top of mind um, and important questions and questions that we should also take forward in the policy discussion with um, our colleagues uh, responsible for policy. But perhaps as we close out now, Tandi, you may want to react to some of those issues and maybe just your final observations and then we're going to work our way through. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, some very real um, concerns, I think, and concerns that we do hear a lot about. Um, are, we, are we providing young people with an education that's going to enable them to get a job, to be productive members of society? Um, and uh, I mean, I have to... I have two kids as well, and I, do, I, I really worry about what the working world is going to look like when they leave, they're still in primary school, when they leave primary school, when they leave high school, when they go, they're very, they're very privileged uh, children. Um, but what will the world look like? The world of work changes so rapidly that, you know, institutions must, must respond to that. Um, at a policy level, I mean, all of the issues that you raise um, are certainly being dealt with. Um, I, I think the, the one thing I would say about universities, and, the, and, and of course the point, point about TVET colleges and the need for artisans is a very important point. Um, we really do need people with different kinds of skills and different kinds of knowledges. Um, and of course... Um, the TVET colleges, you know, it's, it's a very important policy goal of our government to, to, to encourage more young people to go into technical and vocational education. And what we are also trying to do is to build the institutional capacity in such a way that we can really respond to that. Um, because some of the qualifications, like Prof mentioned, the NCV, um, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of curriculum development that needs to happen in the TVET colleges. Um, in the university system, it's much more complex in the sense that a university degree doesn't lead you in all cases directly into a particular occupation. And so the link between higher education and the economy is complex and universities are not responsible for the situation in the economy. In, in actual fact, we have relatively low graduate unemployment in South Africa, mainly because, um, you know, the, the, the value attached to a university degree is very high, and it's like that in all unequal societies, where, you know, <laughs> not, not as many people as would like to get a university education, so those who do end up in good places, but there are issues around how the workplace, you know, how the workplace engages with the universities. It's not to say that there aren't issues, but... The universities are very well set up, and I mean, maybe uh, Doc, Dr. Nolita can give us some you know, ideas about UJ, but curriculum development takes place at university level. But we also have a number of important structures in place. We have, a, we have quality councils that, you know, that look at the kind of curricula that's been developed. We have professional bodies that are very active in engaging with universities about their curricula. Um, so these, con these are real concerns, and they're concerns 
everywhere, and there are issues in our country, but there are certainly concerns that are being taken very seriously. The issue of, uh, you know, for example, uh, a lot of engineering graduates go into banking sector. <laughs> so we, you know, how do you know how many engineers you need to produce? How do you know how many plumbers and electricians you're going to need to produce when people go into other areas? One of the issues in teacher education is that, that not all of our teacher education graduates are going into the public teaching sector. They're going into other kinds of jobs. So we're producing teachers with, with, the, with the relevant qualifications and not all of them are getting jobs in the public sector. So there's, there's, these supply and demand issues are very, are, are very complex. Um, and, and I think that the concerns you raise, uh, both the speakers have raised, are, are concerns that every South African, you know, every person in this congregation would be worried about whether they have children or, you know, whether we're all, in a sense, we're all navigating our, our we're all navigating the working world. Um, those of us who are closer to the end of our working lives, I guess, we can adapt and we will adapt, but we worry for our young people what they're going to be entering into and, and you know, the, the technological skills they're gonna need, absolutely massive. The kind of resilience around, you know, dealing with the, the pressures of the modern world and the pressures of pandemics and climate change and all of those things. Um, yeah, from, from a, as a government, just to end off, Prof, as a government as a public servant, I guess my biggest desire for us in the education system um, is that we can create the kind of policy stability and by policy stability I mean the policy stability that comes with our ability to build the capacity of the system and our ability to fund the system properly so that we can really try and make an impact on all of these issues so that we can produce the relevant curricula so that we can create enough academic staff that are teaching that we can really allow students to succeed, that we can provide them with the support that they need. Thanks, cool. Prof. Thanks, thanks very much. I mean, it, 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 I, I suspect that we won't have this conversation if the economy was cracking. We wouldn't have this conversation. Um, we might have it, but differently. Uh, but but in, a, in a context in which the economy is snail pace, I mean, the forecast for this year is under 2% growth. Now, it means that there are problems further upstream that are not being dealt with. And my approach has always been pragmatic. It has always been pragmatic. By that, I mean simply that our job is to create the learning opportunities. Our job is to make sure every young child enters school, completes school, enters a college or university, completes college or university, right? And why do I say that? It is when the economy picks up, I can reset myself. I can adapt my skills and capabilities, yeah? I can adjust them. And as parents, we carry also that load and responsibility to help our children adapt, build resilience enable them to, to, to make a sidestep. So maybe that, that was a mistake. Let's try something else. Don't delay until they're 40 years old. It's too late. Let's make those changes and help them. By the time that they're in their mid-20s, they are in a good, good position. And so, I mean, I'm a critic of the TVET system. So a severe critic of it. But my response always to Minister Nzimande is just get a good quality qualification. Make sure that those young people complete their qualifications. Because when the economy picks up, they can again adjust. They can ad again adapt those capabilities. So yes, uh, Chippa, they might be learning. Uh, I worry also about our un universities of technology. They might be learning uh, humanities at the University of Technology, which is a big and interesting issue. Of course, you have to break down those human sciences down and you will get vocations yeah? um, and professions that are taught in those, college, uh, sorry, in those universities of technologies. Uh, and so, yes, we are concerned about what we are teaching there uh, and we must raise these questions. 
In the end, let us help our young people to complete their qualifications. The economy, hopefully, in 10 years' time will turn. Okay, in three years' time will turn. Right? <laughs> okay, Bianca. <laughs> Can I just have a few seconds sure. to defend my favorite subject? Yeah. Being maths lit. You, we all spoke about how there's a lack of certain skills, right? And it starts at the basis of understanding an individual and your capabilities as a person. So they spoke about, or rather, the panel spoke about how you would not have any opportunities, rather, or limited amount of opportunities when doing mathematical literacy, which is quite a contradiction because if you think about it, mathema mathematical literacy is one thing that enables us to interact with real-life mathematics on a daily basis. I'll never see how X looks like, However, I might come in contact with whatever questions that might arise from mathematical literacy. And my other thing becomes, why do pure maths when you are failing so horribly at it? <laughs> that is the reality of what is happening in our schools. We, or rather people do subjects in order to say, okay, I'm doing pure maths, look at me. Whereas you are producing a 30%. It starts with understanding who you are as an individual. It starts with understanding your capabilities. You might be at a position where you do understand both the aspects. You might be good at, okay, you might have been good at pure maths and maths that for me, like me, for example. But it was in me understanding that I'm a very social person. I would never survive in a pure maths class. And it starts with understanding that you apply your skills to certain subjects. So I will disagree and say okay, cool. maths <laughs> has a place. In yes. defense of math literacy. Yes. Cool. Got it. Uh, Sis Odwa, your final comment, and then we'll come to Sis Nolita, and then we'll close. Thank you, Prof. Um, to answer what uh, Mr. Guetta was asking um, about our, the curriculum. Um, the, remember our curriculum, since COVID, it has been trimmed. And as also Bianca have mentioned that uh, teachers will also do uh, the multi-grading. Multi so that means that now the government, uh, the department requested us now to to do either the baseline assessment for each and every grade. Remember, we only had um, the screening from grade R up to grade three, but now from grade four until grade 12, we have um, the baseline assessment, whereby we need, it's a must and it's very significant that we need to administer that um, so that we'll be able to do uh, the results analysis. And that process, it has to happen in the first week of the, the term which is the first week of when you reopen the schools. So when you do the baseline assessment, it's whereby you'll be able to, you'll be able to know and understand where are, the, where, the, where are the learners. If those learners, let's say we take grade seven learners, then you'll be able to trace that, um, did they cover all the aspects of the previous grade? And then that's when you introduce the, the multi-grading, meaning that you'll be teaching their quad. And then the fortunate part that we received from the, the government is um, they, they deployed um, the Presidential Youth Empowerment Initiative. Uh, among those youth, uh, they are educator assistants. So, you, you know, it is overwhelming. I'll do an example of the science. For each uh, term, we have four topics. So now when you do the multi-grading, now you realize that the learners, they've lost. There's a learn, learner losses. So now it means that you'll be adding another topic. So now the, the youth, that's where they come in and they, they assist us doing a, a, a remedial. So in all, right now we are, I would say we are, I don't want to say we are managing because we still have challenges. We, we are coping. Okay, good, good. This is not it. Actually, in the... Uh, interest of time, because I see that uh, Umfundi Sunkinga is running out of parishioners. 
<laughs> uh, I think we will end up being the last panel to say the grace. <laughs> Just to acknowledge that the, the mismatch of supply and demand is a structural and systemic issue. Um, inherited or maintained by the system. And so we can't sit here and, and try to, you know, we will try elsewhere, but I'm just saying I acknowledge the existence of that issue. Um, but also, uh, there is a little bit of, um, in that severe circumstance, um, there is a culture of having a qualification and waiting for the next position to arrive. So that's also because education teaches us to imagine and education teaches us to provide answers and to consider consequences. It teaches us to be flexible and to be adaptable. Some of the brothers and sisters from other countries, they beat us to this. They come and they will, they will be bus drivers with MA. So sometimes it calls for flexibility and adaptability while we wait for the train to be set right. And because even in my village and elsewhere, everybody will say, I have got this, but I'm waiting. Because our education, sadly, has also shaped us into being employed and not considering to do things for ourselves. Somebody spoke of the plumbers. A plumber, a call-out fee for a plumber is 500 rand. And that is before they actually give you the invoice of the work done. I have a Samsung fridge that gave up. There was a Samsung technician who came from elsewhere in Africa. And so I think that we really need to expose these that were not otherwise sexy. Because I think also the youth is for sexy degrees and sexy qualifications. And when you talk about electricians and plumbers, then what I'm trying to say, because I want a degree first. And, and so there is a, 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 a Tandi, I know that we need to consider this. It's a structural problem. But meanwhile, UJ, if I can say it as the last one, is that we provide a free artificial intelligence course. <laughs> Exactly in recognition of the fact that the world now is where it is in terms of uh, industrial revolution. And also we offer entrepreneurship so that one considers what you have learned, how you can valuarize it, value valorization, extracting value from what you know, because you have already been given the instruments of thinking systematically. So when you have a degree and you are thinking systematically, what else can you provide given the inconvenience and given what you think could have happened best? And so it is, it, it is something that is in the making. Even next year we'll be talking about it. But as you were saying, Bianca, sometimes there is a need to take things to ourselves, recalibrate, readapt, re-engineer, and then perhaps therein lies the answer. Meanwhile. Cool. There we have it. Uh, so some strong messages as we close out. Uh, very important messages. Let's create safe homes for our young people. Think about that. Think about that young child who rather wants to be at university than at home. Or at college than at home. Meaning away from home. And so let's think about the support that our young people need. That our children need so desperately. Let's think about also the spiritual support that they need and the spiritual encouragement, the words that they need to be given every day or guided, at least offered every day. Let's think and reflect um, on what that qualification means in the end. That grade 12 certificate or NSC, that technical TVET college certificate, that university qualification. In the end, we can't sit on our hands with that qualification. We've got to be street smart. Yeah? We need to focus yes. yeah? We Otherwise, somebody else is, what do they say? Eating our breakfast. Yeah? And so we have to encourage our young people again, whether it is the principal or the teacher or the lecturer or the HOD or the dean or the vice chancellor or the deputies. We all have to play a role in encouraging innovation 
activism uh, and engagement on the part of our students and our graduates. We can't fold our hands and say, hey, I'm unemployed. I'm sitting with a bachelor's degree with three languages. Why am I sitting unemployed when I'm not using that qualification? Alternatively, there must be alternatives for me to going down that particular road. So, Mfundisi, we, we're most grateful to our panel. Let's give them a round of applause. And let me invite Mfundisi Nkwinga just to hand over some gifts to the panelists, some books that we have selected for you. Uh, here's a book for Bianca. Hopefully she will enjoy reading Will Smith. Yeah? And a gift for uh, Sis Odwa. Uh, this one is called uh, Female Fear Factory. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, Professor Gola. Um, I didn't want to... I've, I've got the uh, big... For, for Utandi. And then for Sis Noleta. Yeah, I think that is it. I've got some big books here. <laughs> uh, but I didn't want to give... Let's give another round of applause. <laughs> you want to take a photo? Let's take a quick photo. Let me take this one. to all our panelists, a huge thank you to each of them for the very valuable contribution that we have received from each one of them. And thank you for being here with us today. Um, people believe in a sermon, so I prepared an hour sermon for today, so you must brace up for another hour of preaching. Can we just sing one verse of the sermon hymn? And um, I want to just say a few words and then we can close.
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for conversations that stretch the boundaries of our hearts and minds. The questions are many, and the strides are many, and the challenges continue to remain. We ask for your wisdom as we shape the future with you. In the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Friends, just to first acknowledge the gift of this morning. Um, sometimes we do worry about time, but I think when we're having variable conversations, sometimes we might have to relax and allow ourselves just the liberty of once in a year have an authentic conversation about the life of our land, the plight of our children, the plight of our education system. So we are grateful to Prof and the team for having facilitated this. So my first thing would be just what word can we say to the education system now? What words? would be relevant. And I have three simple words. I think we acknowledge the level of the weariness that has come with COVID-19 and having to deal with so much disruption, the challenges of innovating so fast. Since Nolita used a series of re, re, re words that as she concluded, because there was so much that had to be done in a short space of time and our people have done so much our teachers have done so much. The system, government has done so much. We have seen the most agile of spaces in the time that we've had to address the challenges of education and COVID and everything around it. And so the first word I want to say to the teachers, to the children of Bianca that have pushed through the odds is we want to say, we want to say thank you to each one of you. Thank you for the efforts that you've put in. Thank you for the time that you've given to that. Thank you for the energy that you've expended in innovating and trying and working through the weariness and, the, and all of the disruptions that you've worked through. The first word would be thank you. The second word linked to that is would be that wherever we are, let's offer a word of encouragement to all our teachers and all our educators and everyone that is involved with the education system. Because somehow it is so easy to count the realities and the problems that go with the challenges around education now. But the people that have to wake up and teach children and put aside all of the things that they are going through in their own lives and have to garner the energy and do it over and over in each and every day, even in mediums they don't even understand themselves, we need to offer them a word of encouragement and say, we can see your efforts. We can see the things you are doing. We hope that God gives you strength to continue to maneuver and work towards the future that we have been called to create as you try. And the third is for me, thank you, and you. Uh, we hope that you find encouragement somehow. And the third word for me is the word hope. Somehow, in the midst of the things that we're talking about here, there's so much hope. There's so much hope for us to bridge the gap between poverty and education. There's so much hope to begin to understand the magnitude of the inequalities of access, uh, inequalities of the economy, the issues of poverty, and all of the gradings that exist in this 
whole conversation. We have an opportunity now to really address these things in a holistic manner. The fact that there are small movements, there are big movements, like 350 as a marker, those are big movements in the life of a country and in the life of a democracy this year. So we must acknowledge and take and encourage and give hope to all the people that are involved with our education system. Then one word from our text this morning, and I will close. Just one word. If I were to theme the sermon, it would have been throw, plunge into the deep. That would have been my sermon today. Plunge into the deep. So we have two texts that speak of the similar, similar issue. We have a text in Isaiah where Isaiah has, after 50 years of seeming progress under the King Uzziah, and as this progress happens, there's a sense of stability in the nation. There's a growth. The economy maybe is going higher than 2%, and there's a consistency. And then the person that seems to have made so much change for the nation dies. And the prophet lands in the temple to grieve, to try and deal with the chaos of the loss. And then it is the moment of encounter. We have on the other side disciples that now have done so much through the night. They have braved the night. They are in the sea. They wake up in the morning. There's nothing else to do. They are on the shore and almost in the moment of giving up. And then, as the text would say, they are washing nets. Let me just use a simplistic analogy for washing of nets. When you are, your back is against the wall and all of your resources that you've spent in the trudge of the night are almost gone, and you stand by the wall and you say, and you are recalibrating this knowledge, trying to figure out, should I do it again or should I leave it now? What else, what is next for me? In the moment of King Uzziah's loss, Isaiah is going through uncertainty, chaos, and loss, and fear, and struggle. The disciples, at the same time, they are dealing with their own livelihoods. And they are in a place where they don't know what to do next. And then comes Jesus. And Jesus says to them, I, can I just use your boat, Peter? Can we move off the edge of the water? And he sits there with them and starts teaching. And then the change moment happens when Jesus says to Peter, do you want to go with me to the deep? Can I say just a simple, simple thing? In the moments of crisis, in the moments of uncertainty, in the moments of change, in the moments of transition, in the moments when you don't know what next, that is the God moment. That is the moment when God can whisper in your spirit and in your heart and change your destiny. It is in the moment when we woke up and we had masks in our face, we had everything else that said, now life has changed, that we discovered in the uncertainty and the fear, we discovered what skills we had. It is in the moments of trial, in the moments of crisis, that you should be attentive to the whisper and the call of God. And so as we get out of COVID, as we move into the next level of where we're going, let's be attentive to the whisper of the God that calls Uzziah, who calls Isaiah out of his own grief because of his own loss, out of the chaos and the tragedy that he foresees in the future, the political turmoil that he sees for the nation, the economic turmoil that he foresees for the nation. Out of all of those things, God takes that and creates a moment of transition and hope and newness and possibility and new beginnings, and something else. But there is a challenge for me and you. Are you willing that when Jesus says, come with me to the deep, are you willing to listen 
to the God that calls you beyond your fears, beyond your anxieties, beyond the immediate crisis, beyond what you see in front of you, and hear and say, I will walk from the edge of the river to the heart of the chaos. Change doesn't happen by recoiling. Growth doesn't happen by re- getting out of the water for the disciples. They are called into the heart of the water. And all they have to hope for and trust in is the power and the presence of the one that's speaking to them and calling them into that heart of the water. And then, then says to them, throw the net on the other side, where the, the, the heart of the sea. Almost to say, whatever data you're dealing with in your hands this side, there's another side to the data. Whatever the crisis looks like, God is creating something. God is working out of darkness into light, out of, out of lockdown into freedom, out of hopelessness into newness, out of desolation into hope, out of all of these things. God is saying, would you dare to turn your eyes away from what you see, the magnitude of the challenge you see, turn your eyes away and throw and walk with me into the deep because in the deep, that's where the real thing happens. And for the world, change happens in the moments when you are willing to go to the deep. For yourself, change happens when you are willing to have the deep conversations about your own existence. For everyone, it happens when we face the, the magnitude of the losses we've had. When we have to understand the depth of the realities that are going on. When you are a leader, it happens when you have to wake up and they tell you your department is in a crisis and you wake up and you have to address that. Those are the moments of growth and transition and change and innovation and newness and possibility. Would you dare go with God into the depths where God calls you? Amen. Come, let us pray. So, God, we think of the world we find ourselves in, and we've heard this morning of the deep challenges of what God, what, of what the education sector. It is our prayer, O oh God, that you would walk with us and walk with every child in this country through the change and the transition and the uncertainty and all of that. Walk with us and give them hope and strength. We pray for every sector from the most basic unit, the home, the school, the teachers, the departments in each and every province and across the country. May you lubricate every system such that the future of the child in this land is better. Give strength to leaders. Give wisdom to those that make decisions. Insert in those policies that are made at every sector and every level new pathways of hope that will give the best future for the children of this land. Use us, O oh God. Call us even through the crisis. Call us even through the losses. Call us even through the uncertainty into the place and the time and the space where you, oh God, are going to use us to change the world. Make us willing to listen to your voice and go with you into the deep. Because there, oh God, you revolutionize our lives and you use us to change the world. In the name of Christ and for his sake. And so as usual, O oh God, we come to this place with our gifts to give to you. We've given you our gift of worship. But we give to you now as we conclude this service through the giving of our money and our resources. So as we give and as we contribute to the ministry of this church through our offertory and our pledges and our tithes and all of that, 
we ask for your blessing upon each and every gift of God. We pray that you bless those that will give here in this moment and those that will give at home through our online giving systems. And we ask that you bless each of these things in the wonderful and strong name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So friends, we have come to the end of our time together. I ask that you rise with me as we join in the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, and the Lord of peace be with you.